Uh, are we good to go? Can we see it? All right, thanks. So yeah, today we're gonna talk about the low hanging fruit of, of digital accessibility. I'm gonna give you a, a few tips to, to think about and some things that you can do right away. So as uh, Ms. Ali told you, I'm the director of the Virtual Learning Communities Professional Development Center. And my job is to uh, you know, travel the state and help you with your accessibility. Um, it's a free service. So if you need help with any kind of digital accessibility, you simply email or call. And if my schedule is available, my schedule fills up fairly quickly. If the scheduling is available, we can come out to your college either uh, in person or virtually. Um, I prefer to do it in person. I prefer we go out, we get in a computer lab and we do hands-on things. That works a, a little bit better, but I'm fine with virtual as well. So, you know, my job is to help you with accessibility, course design, those types of things. So yeah, you just call. It's free service. You can call anytime or email anytime uh, with questions, um, things we can do to help. And, you know, we'll be more than happy to, to come out to your, to your college. So today we're gonna talk about the low hanging fruit of digital accessibility. So I'm gonna give you five easy things that you can do. You can leave today um, after listening today and, and do these five simple things that you can implement that'll make things more accessible uh, for you and in, in your content. Um, plus you're gonna get a couple of, maybe one or two uh, bonus things. Um, but the point of this was to give you some accessibility, some easy accessibility techniques you could use. But the first thing I wanna talk about is, I don't know what college you're at or where, where you are, but what is your typical user? And that's kind of a trick loaded question because there really is no such thing as a typical user. We don't know what the typical user is. Um, everybody's different. Um, they could be colorblind. They could be registered with your DSS office. They could not be registered with your DSS office. We don't know. So when I talk about accessibility, I'm talking about everybody. Okay, I'm not just talking about, you know, people who are visually impaired or hearing impaired. We're talking about designing content one time that everybody uh, can use. So, I put that typical user slide up there to kind of illustrate there is no such thing as a typical user. That's, um, that's a fallacy. That's, nobody knows what that is. And I always show uh, this slide because it sort of, it encapsulates my philosophy on accessibility. Okay. Hopefully it'll get you to think about things maybe a little bit differently. So you see the kid in the wheelchair, he asked the custodian, could you please shovel the ramp? And the custodian says, all these other kids are waiting. Um, when I get through shoveling the, off the stairs, I'll clear the ramp for you. And then the kid in the wheelchair says, but if you shovel the ramp, we can all get it, all right? So he'll only have to do it one time and everybody can get in and then he can you know, worry about the steps a, a little bit later. And, and I do that, to, kind of get you to, to think about how when you sort of widen the path, it's wider for everybody. Even for people who maybe don't necessarily quote unquote need accessibility um, considerations. It makes things easier for them as well. And one of the stories I like to tell is that when I first got into accessibility, I guess, Wow, these years were running together. I guess that was 15 years ago, 12 to 15. It seems shorter and longer at the same time, if that makes sense. But there was someone who was suing all of our big cities in America for wheelchair ramps. And uh, whoever it was, they didn't want their identity known, but they were spending like millions and millions and millions of dollars. Whoever it was had like deep unlimited pockets. Well, we came to find out, find out that it was, it was Federal Express which makes sense if you think about it, right? Wheelchair ramps are critical for them, right? Um, saves their driver's time. 
And that's a good illustration. When the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed, Federal Express, when it was passed in Congress, Federal Express didn't exist as a country, as a company, right? There was no such thing as Federal Express. It didn't even exist. Yet those wheelchair ramps, those curb cuts that were mandated by the Americans with Disabilities Act became more important to Federal Express than even the disability, or just as important to them for different reasons as it did to the accessibility community. So just something to, to think about there. So if you want all the accessibility standards, here they are. Um, this is called YCAG. You can go get them at w3.org. Uh, and it'll go through minute detail on all of these techniques and strategies. But you don't need to know all that, right? Your local, if you have a local accessibility person, they need to know most of that, but even they don't need to know all of it. But there are a couple things you need to know. And one of those is that most disabilities are invisible and your users are all very different, right? You could be listening to somebody with a disability right now. You never know, right? You don't, all you know about me is I'm good looking. That's it. That's a joke. Sometimes when I tell that live, people laugh a little too hard at that. So, that, that, so I try to use that one sparingly. Um, yeah, most disabilities are invisible. You can't walk into a classroom or see your students online or Zoom with them and say, well, this kid's disabled, disabled, or that student's disabled. You, you can't do that. They're invisible. You don't know. Um, unless there, there are some, of course, visible disabilities, but the vast majority of them are totally invisible. And we could all become disabled at any time, right? I, um, I was having a snowball fight with my son and I tore a tendon. And I realized this was a couple of years ago. And, and I realized that we're all disabled sometime. And I didn't realize how, how the world was set up for people who could bend their knees, right? From driving to walking to almost everything. So I was disabled for you know, a few months, uh, but it was a good indication that, you know, disability is something that could happen to any of us at any time. So, you know, just keep in mind that most of the disabilities you're gonna be talking about, they happen to be invisible. We can't necessarily always see those. Um, you, do, you do need to know just a few basic skills that can make your content more accessible. And then you need to know, okay, I've got a question, where do I go for help? Who can I talk to either on my campus or somewhere else? So today we're gonna to talk about that low hanging fruit and it's gonna be really five things and a couple of bonuses um, of things that you can do that will help you uh, become to create more accessible content. So we're gonna talk about using headings and documents. And that's an easy thing that uh, people like to do because it creates structures in Word documents and it makes it easier for you as a user. It's one of those accessibility things that really is, um, it's really a usability thing. And it ends up making things a lot, lot easier. We'll talk about alternative text and image descriptions. Um, what alternative text is, how you use that. We'll talk a little bit about math. Uh, we'll talk about captioning videos. And we're really gonna talk about don't use color alone to convey information. So those are gonna be our sort of low hanging fruit. So the first thing we wanna talk about is headings in a document. Um, a lot of times we use bold in documents, but that's not a proper heading. Headings create structure to your documents and they allow you to navigate through your documents um, quickly and simply. And that's just, they're located on that styles group in Word. And one of the things I talk about, particularly when I'm teaching Word accessibility, I tell people all the time, Word is a very accessible program. You just have to know how to use it. And most of us have never uh, gone somewhere where we sat down and we've had a Word class or somebody said, hey, here's what these menus do. Here's how to use Word. Here's what the styles group does. 
here's how you can sort of automate the process of creating documents. And somebody has not walked us through almost everything in Word. So if you use the built-in features of Word and you become more efficient at using Word, um, you get more efficient, it becomes quicker and easier for you to use. A side effect of that is you're gonna create accessible documents. So I teach Word, when I teach Word accessibility, um, I don't really even talk about accessibility. I tell my class, I, I teach a class and I tell them, I'm gonna show you how to use Word efficiently. And if they even mention the word accessibility, I act like I don't know what they're talking about. I said, what does that mean? And then they'll say something like, well, I know you're the accessibility person, you know what it means. But what I'm trying to get them to see, I want them to see the relationship between becoming a power user at Word, really efficiently using Word, understanding it, and accessibility. That a side effect of really knowing how to use Word is you end up creating accessible documents. Now I could talk to you for hours about the styles group and what that does, how we can um, automate, how we create documents, how we can create documents quicker and easier doing things uh, through the styles group. But we don't have time for that today. Uh, but if you use headings in your document and headings are just an outline, they just create an outline of your document and they just give it structure. So that's one of the, the best and the easiest ways you can create um, accessibility in Word. And, you know, there's six levels of headings. There's heading level one, two, three, four, five, and six. And people ask me all the time, they'll say, um, when should I use a heading two or a heading three? Now, this is me generally. There's no rule against this. But I use only one heading one per document. And the reason I do that, I, I use the heading one as sort of the title of my book. Um, then heading twos through sixes are like chapter titles for me. And people ask me all the time, um, some people use heading one, you know, multiple times throughout a document. That's fine. I just choose not to do it that way. That's just my uh, personal preference. And a lot of times people will say, well, you know, Darren, when do I use a heading two or a heading three? And I always say, I don't know, because I don't know what you're trying to categorize, right? If you're trying to categorize, say, you know, uh, big box retailers, right? You may say, these are big box retailers. We have Walmart, we have Target, we have, you know, TJ Maxx, we have Home Goods, And then you might wanna, you know, further designate those by saying, here's big box retailers that sell electronics. You know, we have uh, Best Buy, we have HH Gregg, we have, so it depends on what you're trying to um, actually, what you're trying to structure. And we'll see headings and actions in action a little bit later. So that's the first thing you can do is just use headings, create structure in your Word documents. Another big one is alternative text and image descriptions. Um, and alternative text is just, it allows screen reader users to know that there's a picture there. And I've always argued this in higher education and I'm open to someone changing my mind but I'd argue that we use images for three reasons in higher education. Either they're decoration, they're just there to pretty things up, they're an example of something, or they're actual content. And I was at a college, uh, actually a couple of weeks ago, uh, my first travel back, and, and a lady said, well, I don't post any content. She said, you're wrong about that, because I don't post any content any pictures that are content. So I asked her, I said, well, what do you do, you know, at this college? She said, I'm in financial aid. So we pulled up the financial aid page and she posted an infographic on uh, FAFSA, you know, financial aid. I said, ma'am, we could argue that's the most important content at this college or some of the most important content at this college. So when I say we only use images for three reasons, and when I say content, I don't mean content as, you know, I teach physics or I teach geography. I use content in a more expansive way. That can be, it is, I think, a lot of things are, are content. Your alternative text should, should equal the image or tell us, and again, it's gonna be context related. So 
if I have a, a picture, going back to my, my retail example, if I have a picture of, of women's jeans and say, say, you know, Target sells women's jeans, and then I have a picture of the jeans, you don't care what size, color they are, that's an example. That's saying, hey, we're talking about big box retailers, Target is one, Target sells women's jeans. But if I'm trying to get women to buy jeans, I do need to talk about the color, the fit, the style, the price. So I want you to understand that when it comes to alternative text, it depends on the context. The context is key. So I could have that same picture of those jeans. My alternative text is going to be very, very different depending on that context. Am I just talking about, hey, Target sells women's jeans? Or am I actually trying to sell women's jeans to, to real women? And I need to talk about, here's the color. Here's how much they cost. Here's how long they last. Can you take them to the dry cleaners? Um, if you put them in the dryer, will they shrink? So there's a lot of uh, different things I need to do. When I say alternative text should equal the image, it should equal that, why, they, why is that image there? Is it decoration? Is it an example or is it content? And the image descriptions are used for everyone, right? These image descriptions put my images in context for, for all students. So I'm gonna give you an example. If you ever go to, um, Mexico City, which you should if you ever get the chance, uh, you should definitely visit. Once you go downtown, this is a, a, an image of the downtown Mexico City. So you're walking, if you look up and you see this El Angel statue, you know that you are in, near the arts district, uh, you're near the sort of the arts museum district of Mexico City. So, Again, this image is gonna change. So I have an image description for this and I'm gonna talk about the alt text and I'm gonna talk about you know, this image description. So my image description is for everybody, right? Even my, my non-disabled students, hopefully they can read this description, look at the image, look at the image, read the description and it helps them make that neural connection a little bit image in more context. So my long description is a photo of the downtown Mexico City skyline with the El Angel statue in the foreground. The statue is a gold sculpture of the winged goddess Victory, which commemorates Mexico's independence from Spain. So that's really all I'm talking about. Now, this, is, this image description is from a real um, geography class. Okay, now if this was an art history class, that image description would be different and that alt text would be different. For the alt text here, all I put was the El Angel statue, downtown Mexico City. I mean, that was, because that's what it is because I've described it for everybody. I know people with screen readers, their screen reader will read that description. And it's really an example here. I'm just showing them an example of the Mexico City downtown skyline. So in that context, in the context of this geography class, it doesn't matter what she's holding in her hands. It doesn't matter that um, she's gold. Um, I really wouldn't talk about how her skirt, her skirt is sort of billowing in the wind or what she's holding. Now, if this was a, a class on world history and, and Mexican history, then all those things would be important. Or if this was an art history class, I might talk about the technique and that image description of how the statue was created, um, how they got the detail, how they got it up that high, um, just the, the technique of it. So I just wanna let you know that when it comes to image description and alt text that we essentially use in higher education. I, I think that's my theory that we use images for primarily three reasons. I'm open to being wrong on that and convinced that there are other reasons. Um, and I use those as three sort of general, all encompassing reasons of why we use images. Um, but the main thing to remember about alt text and image descriptions 
is that they are very, very context related. They're entirely context related. And you know, your, your alt text or your image description, um, it's gonna change depending on uh, what, which one of those three reasons you have that image there. So we talked about using headings and using alt text for, for images and image descriptions. Those were the, you know, the first two things we could do in these, this sort of, this low hanging fruit, things you can do today uh, to make your content a little bit more accessible. If you teach math, one of the easiest things to do is, is use MathML for STEM content. Uh, MathML is a markup language uh, for math that is screen reader accessible. Um, it works every time if you put it in MathML. Um, that's a sort of, that's one of those true statements like saying to be a millionaire, all you have to do is have assets of a million dollars or more. Uh, that's true. It's a simple statement, but it's not easy. Uh, so getting math into MathML is not as um, easy as it sounds when you do it. That math is going to be screen reader accessible. And uh, we do training on this at, at the BLCPD Center. We can show you how to do that in a, uh, in a less cumbersome way. And we have a math manual that will be coming out. Actually, we're going to do a webinar on our math manual next week. And it'll be coming out the first week in May. So we walk you through that process of creating accessible math content. So that's one of the things you can do with math is just uh, use MathML for any of your STEM content. Um, there are various ways to do it. If you create math with MathML, it is going to be screen reader accessible. You don't need to learn MathML. There's an easy way to do it. There's a program called MathType um, that's out there. It's a subscription-based model. It's a plugin that goes into Word. It's very easy to use if you've ever used. If you're a math instructor and you're listening, if you've ever used the equation editor, the Microsoft built-in equation editor, uh, math type works exactly the same way. Uh, side effect of math type is it's, it has uh, a few more options for you and it creates screen reader accessible math. It's a subscription service. Um, it's, you can sometimes find it for uh, $39 a year, sometimes it's more. Oh, somebody raised their hand. Uh, please unmute yourself and, and, and ask your question. Yes, Darren, thank you so much for sharing the software that you mentioned. Will you repeat the name of that software one more time or the, um, the resource one more time about math? Will you repeat that one more time? Oh, sure. It's called Math Type. And math you, type. you can just type in Math Type. Uh, into Google and it'll take you to the company that makes it. It's called Weiris. And Math Type is just, it'll be a plug-in on your Word ribbon. And you'll be able to create uh, screen reader accessible math using it. Um, it's very uh, user-friendly. And you know, it sometimes you can find it for $39 a year. They have specials. Uh, Sometimes it's $49 a year. They have site license for it. I think Wake Tech uses a uh, math type for just about everything. And what I like personally about math type is if you're creating accessible math, what it does, first of all, it makes it easy for you to do it. Um, it allows you to put it in Braille if a student needs that, um, to publish it to the web if a student needs that. And it's just a versatile tool. It's not the only tool uh, for creating accessible math. And that's what our guide, this guide I was telling you about that we're, we're, we're going to publish in May. Um, it goes over a lot of different tools. Um, I just wanted to introduce you to math type if you've never um, heard about it or seen it. And you're a math instructor in here. It's something that could, could really help you um, and your quest to create more accessible material. And then one more thing about math, there's another way to create accessible math. It's called LaTeX. I know that looks like LaTeX, but it's pronounced either LaTeX or LaTeX. 
Um, either way, is it's fine. And it's a document preparation system. And, and what, uh, what it does, probably every math book you've had in your life, math or science book you've had, um, it's, um, it's been published in LaTeX. I have a question here from, um, I think Charlene said, so what did he say was coming out in May? In May we're gonna, and I'll, I'll share this with you in, in just a second. We have, um, the VLC publishes something called the, the Online Accessibility Handbook. So it's about a hundred pages and it walks you through creating accessible materials for online classes. So we've created a math companion piece to that, which lays out how to create accessible math content digitally. Um, and we do it with screenshots. We talk about tools and techniques for creating accessible math and workflows. And we're finished with it. We're getting it um, copy edited. Uh, we're getting it, you know, making sure we don't, I don't have any grammatical mistakes in it. All right. So uh, when we do these guides, um, just to take you a little bit behind the curtain. So our online access accessibility handbook is once we create it, uh, we send it off to uh, some people in Texas and California, and they sort of fact check us. Uh, you know, we know accessibility pretty well at the PD Center, but they fact check us, make sure we haven't missed anything. Um, we then will send it to, we have a copy editor here at Wake Tech who copy edits and finds all my grammatical mistakes. So once we're, so let me back up a little bit. So once I, once we finish, the accessibility handbook and we send it off to the people in Texas and California to sort of fact check for us. Any notes we get from them, we revise our guide. Then we send it to our, our copy editor at Wake Tech and she goes over all of our grammatical mistakes, our continuity mistakes, and then we revise it again. And then we send it to the Quality and Assessment Center at Story Community College, another um, arm of the VLC. And then they look at it and offer us any guidance and feedback. And then we revise it again. So we revise these guides uh, about three times. Um, they're extensive. And I, I'll share these with you in, in just a little bit. I'll let you look at it. Um, so that's sort of how we do things. So we're going to have a math accessibility guide. And I'll show you the. Um, you know, the online accessibility guide in, in just a minute and in a few minutes and um, you'll get to see how we, how that looks, where you can get it and, and that kind of thing. So as I said, LaTeX is, a, it's just a document, it's a printing system. Um, but what's good about LaTeX is you can get, if you print things in LaTeX uh, and you're a math instructor, we can easily make that accessible. Um, in just a few steps. It doesn't really take long. It's like one or two steps, we can do that. So that's LaTeX, that's sort of a, a bonus for, for math. So we were talking about just those things you can do. We talked about those headings. Uh, we talked about alt text and image descriptions. We talked about using MathML. Uh, for math to make that more accessible. And, you know, LaTeX was sort of your bonus uh, sort of tool for accessible math. And what's good about LaTeX is depending on where your math faculty at your college went to graduate school, a lot of graduate schools make, um, you know, math candidates learn LaTeX. And once they learn it, they don't always know it, but once they learn LaTeX, they in essence have an accessible class or content, depending on how much is published in that language. Okay, one of the next things we're gonna talk about is, hey, make sure your videos are captured. And one of the things that, remember we talked earlier, I, I talked to you a little bit about curb cuts, about wheelchair ramps, well, many, many moons ago when I was in college, I did an exchange 
And I went to Montreal. Montreal is in Quebec. It's in French-speaking Canada. And I had pretty good textbook command of, of French, right? I knew the language fairly well, I thought. Um, but, you know, you never get the nuances or the inflection or the, you know, the, the slang. I mean, you don't get those things. So I'm not deaf, not hard of hearing, but one of the things I did uh, when I got there, because I could understand people, uh, right? I could, you know, if I went to the store and I needed to get something, I could understand people. I could, you know, if I said, where's the, you know, soap? And I could ask those questions and they told me where the soap was. I, I knew it was an aisle five. Um, but my French wasn't as good as I thought it was. So what I did was I went and I'd watch the weather reports and I just turn on the captions. Right, I turn on the closed caption. And I learned more French that way, looking at captions, than I did in all those years I've been studying in those books. So I'm, I'm trying to show you that closed captions aren't just for people who are hard of hearing. Um, I had a student in one of my classes, and I captioned all my videos in class, and she came to me one day and said, thank you so much for captioning these videos. And I was curious, I just asked, I said, I'm just curious, why do you care if I caption videos? You, you know, you obviously um, are not deaf, you can hear, I mean, why do you care? She said, well, I have an infinite home and, you know, my husband works second shift and so I'm putting the baby down and I study a lot at night and my, you know, my husband comes, he's going to sleep, the baby's asleep. She said, I live in a small apartment. So I watch the videos caption so there's no sound so again it was i didn't create those caption videos for her specifically right and i kind of wasn't thinking about her specifically when i created those caption videos um but she uses them so you know that accessibility technique helps more people than than it was created for so make sure your videos are captioned and i will say that if you put your, your videos on YouTube, YouTube's auto captions are pretty good. Um, you're gonna have to go clean them up a little bit, but for the most part, um, they're gonna get pretty much uh, what you're saying. And the next thing I wanna talk to you about is, and this is something we do quite a bit, and this is gonna seem like an accessibility point, but it's really not, and I hope I'll, convey this a little bit clearer in just a minute. One of the things that we accessibility people always say is don't use color alone to convey information. If you wanna use color, I, I don't, I'm not the color police, all right? I wish my biggest problem in life was whether people use color or not. Oh, that would be great. But I am gonna emphasize don't use color alone to convey information. So if you're going to use color, give them some sort of other visual cue besides just color. So either bold something, put it in italics, do something to convey that information, um, not just using color alone. And I'm going to show you something next. And this is going to get to a, this is about conveying information via color, but I really think this is more about pedagogy. So this was uh, a few years ago. Um, gosh, I guess seven now, because it was in 14. This was a, you can see the, the dates on the, uh, on the slide there. So I was working with a geography instructor and she said, I like this graph because I like the way this shows color. And I know you're gonna say this is inaccessible, but I'm keeping this graph. I said, hey, you know, you have the, the freedom to do that. I said, and I, I just repeated what I said. I'm going to repeat what I just said earlier. Um, her name was Agnes. She was a young Agnes, which there's not many young Agneses. But anyway, I said, Agnes, I wish my biggest problem was whether you use color or not. So I don't really care. But then I showed her this chart. Right? You had the one here that uses these weird purple and blue colors, which is fine. It's color. But I made a pedagogy argument with her. Um, it was disguised as an accessibility argument, 
but it was really a pedagogy argument. I said, Agnes, I think this graph here on the right is easier to understand for everybody. It's better pedagogy because I'm using pluses and minuses. Right At this stage, the students that are in my class now, they know what a plus and minus is. So even though you're using color, I said, you're keeping the color, but you have better pedagogy. I said, this chart on the right is simply easier to understand. It's just better pedagogy. I said, it happens to be accessible. I said, but don't even think about that. And I told her, I said, Agnes, let's not even think about this as a, we're not having an accessibility discussion right now at all. Right now we're talking about pedagogy and which one of these is easier for all your students to understand. Not students with disabilities, um, not A students, B students, struggling students, outstanding students, all your students. Because of this pluses and minuses, because of that other visual cue, this is a lot easier to understand on the right than the one on the left is. And it wouldn't matter. I said, the one on the right, it wouldn't matter if somebody was colorblind or not. It wouldn't matter, right? They still know what pluses and minuses are. I said, even the people who aren't colorblind, it's easier for them as well. So a lot of times I'm traveling the state and I'm having accessibility um, discussions with people. Accessibility really isn't what we're talking about. Most of the time we're talking about structure or we're talking about pedagogy. And accessibility does fold into that. Um, but if you have a good structured class, you have an accessible class. You have a, a class that is simple to understand. I didn't say easy to understand, I said simple to understand. And sometimes we use those two words, you know, interchangeably, but they have entirely different meanings. My students should always know what they're supposed to be learning. Now, think about what I just said, what they're supposed to be learning. Not what they're actually, actually learning, not if I've designed it well, but at any time I should be able to ask any of my students to be able to email them and say, what's this week's module? And they should be able to answer that. If they can't, that's my fault as an instructor because I haven't conveyed that information enough. Now, remember, I'm not asking them, do you like this subject? Do you get the subject? Do you get what you're supposed to be uh, learning this week? I'm not asking them that. I'm asking them, do you know what we're supposed to be learning in this module? And if I've communicated that enough, whether they're a, a, a star student or a struggling student, they should be able to answer that simple question. So again, I thought this was more of an accessibility discussion. I mean, a more of a pedagogical discussion than an accessibility discussion. And I think this chart on the right is just easier to read, right? Whether you're colorblind or not, uh, whether you need accessibility considerations or not, the one on the right is just easier to read. I think anyway. And one last thing you need to know is where do you go for help on your campus if you have an accessibility question? Um, or where do you go outside of your campus? Do you know um, where you're supposed to go? Who you're supposed to talk to? Um, how do you answer questions if you have those on, on, on accessibility or, or course design or you know those pedagogical considerations? Where, where, where do I go and ask for help? And that's something you'll have to look into if you're on your campus. Uh, I, I can't answer that for you. I can tell you that the, the VLC has an accessibility page. Um, that you can get some things from WebAIM. And you can email me at daevans3 at waketech.edu. My job is to help you create more accessible material. Um, it's a free service. It's paid for by the system office and, and you know, Wake Tech essentially. Uh, the virtual learner community is here for you. So you just call me with a question you have and I answer. You just call me or email me and you'll get answers to your questions, what, whatever they happen to be. So I'm gonna stop sharing this. I'm gonna give this uh, presentation um, to Dolores to she can um, distribute however she wants to. 
um, or do whatever she needs to uh, with it. Um, so that concludes my presentation. Do you have any uh, questions? Any comments or questions? Anything I can help you on? I'm gonna, I am going to show you um, in just a minute uh, a little bit more about headings, just so you'll be able to um, get a better maybe uh, grasp of, of headings and, and, and how they how they work. Let me open up a document for you here. And we'll get to look at uh, headings in just a second. I'll share that with you. And I'll also share our, um, our accessibility handbook. And just a second here. Okay, I'm gonna share our accessibility handbook with you, tell you where, to, where you can uh, get it. And we'll answer any sort of questions you may have after that. Yep, yeah, here we go. All right, so here's our accessibility handbook for online courses. Uh, you can get it, download it at any time. And you can see it's, uh, long, extensive document. It walks you through, basically it's 90 pages. It walks you through creating accessible content for your online courses. That's the purpose of it. That's why we created it. And that's what it does. We try to update it every two years or so, or if things change, we'll do it yearly. This is the 2021 version. Uh, the 2022 version will be out. Um, uh, well, nothing's really changed. So we'll probably wait till 2023 to update it. Uh, but speaking of headings, let's go up here. Uh, first of all, can everybody see this? Let me make sure I... You mean, you mean the handbook? Yes. yes. Yeah, I, I can see your screen just fine, sir. Okay, thank you. All right. I just want to make sure you, you, you never know. So well, let's talk about headings. I'm going to go to view here. And then I'm going to go, so I'm in the view tab in, in Word. And then I'm going to go to navigation pane. And the navigation pane, it opens up all these headings. And again, um, I set these headings by, by going to the styles group here, or you can use this tab to sort of expand the styles group, and you have, as I said, you have six levels of headings. That depends on what you're trying to categorize, but I wanna show you a, a practical consideration of doing headings. So this is a document, again, we update it um, every year and a half to two years, we update it, depending on how things change. So me as a user, what I can do is, let's say something changes with hyperlinks, I have these headings, I've opened up the navigation pane. I click on hyperlinks and it'll take me right to that section of the document. So what these headings do is they save me time, right? By creating that structure, I don't have to, you know, scroll endlessly through to find the hyperlinks. I just go to view navigation pane and I look at the headings. So whenever I'm trying to update or change this document, which I do uh, often. Um, every three years or so, we totally change it. Uh, we change the format. Uh, we totally change how it looks. Um, we're, and we're always trying to make these guides easier for you to understand. And we're trying, always trying to make these guides more user-friendly. So when we get feedback from the colleges, um, we make adjustments based on the, on the feedback we get. So the, those headings, it's an outline and add structure here. So I can just click on any of these, um, any of these headings and it'll take me to that section of the guide. And at the very back of here, I have an appendix um, for you know, accessible math using math type. We walk you through 
how to create accessible math using math type. We have screenshots, um, everything you need. How do you, you know, what do you make the math content look like? The colors, exporting that math to the web. How you do it, okay? We have sections on Word, PowerPoint, everything you need. Now you're probably wondering, great, um, where can I get this? And I'm going to show you. In just a second, I'm going to show you where you can get this, this resource. Any questions on headings or anything you just saw? Anything you, you'd like to see that you... Uh, I have a quick question regarding headings. Uh, what, so I understand the idea of just from structure, like how it just makes the assignment uh, a little bit easier to organize from a formatting perspective, but what is the accessibility portion? Like uh, what is it meant to mitigate? Okay, you see how I, I sort of navigated through this uh, just visually? Right, how I, I kind of saw like long description facts and you saw how I just did that, right? So it's just meant to make it easier to click through the document? Well, now, yes, for me, but say I sent it to my friend Ed, who's, who's totally blind. He can do that same thing with his keyboard, open the navigation pane, and then he can navigate through just by sound. So it gives him a structure. He and I are gonna do the same thing I'm doing it visually, he's doing it through sound. So the accessibility feature is it makes it easier for somebody who's using a screen reader to navigate this document. And it makes it easier for you as the creator. So headings are one of the, not one of the, uh, most of these are win-wins, but it's, it's one of the biggest win-wins in accessibility because it makes it easier for me to structure, navigate this document as a sighted user, just as an end user, right? So when I created these, these headings for this document, I wasn't necessarily thinking about accessibility per se. What I was thinking about was making this document easier to navigate for myself. And I put my syllabus in headings, right? Because really the only thing that changes on my syllabus is you know sometimes my office hours. So I can go to view navigation pane, click on office hours and just change that really quickly. Sure, that only saves me a couple of seconds, right? But if, that, if I save a couple of seconds every time I navigate through a document, we're talking about real time adding up if you navigate as many documents as I do. So that makes, makes sense. Yeah. Uh, my next question, if you don't mind, uh, one thing that we do uh, in the science department is that they really reinforce that if you're referencing a document or you're referencing any separate article, then you need to put in parentheses, Word opens new document or Power or Power or a Microsoft Excel opens new document. Where does that fit in? Oh yeah, that's just a, that, that's a, one of the, another one of those pedagogical things. And, and we talk about that in this guy. I just wanna let people know, where is this? What does it do? Why, why am I going there? It is an accessibility feature in the sense that, so if I sent, sent a document to Ed, um, this is gonna sound really crazy to you, but almost every time I email him, it's I have pictures, even though I know he can't see them. Um, but what it does is when I say new window or new document, it's letting him know he can't see the screen that this is gonna open another program, a new window. So it'll be easier for him to navigate to that new window. Um, what it does for us as, as sighted people is it's just, it's giving me context. It's pedagogy. It's saying, hey, this is going to open to a new, and in a new program. And I'm curious, I have you a question for you. What, what college are you with? Uh, FCCC. Okay. All right. All right. Just, I was just curious. Um, so yeah, that's, a, that's an accessibility slash pedagogical feature. And it's just for, for context. Um, so that's kind of how we do that one. It's 
Good question. Yeah, any questions y'all have, ask away. That's why I'm that's why I'm here. Uh, yeah, I'm so from, I'm in, here <laughs> in the accessibility activities we do, uh, some of the most common things that they reinforce is putting those things in parentheses, making sure you have alternative text, making sure not to underline any words or phrases because they may be misconstrued as a hyperlink, uh, mm -hmm. to provide headings and uh, to not provide unnecessary spaces. Because uh, sometimes what ends up happening is in, in an ADA compliant document looks pretty bland in that everything is kind of organized by one space. There's not a lot of color. Uh, there's not a lot of graphics because you have to provide really, really detailed uh, descriptions. Are there any other big accessibility kind of features or things that are important to include or, or important to uh, that, uh, that I may not be thinking of? I would argue that you hit most of the, the major ones. One thing we don't talk about a lot is fonts, right? Just do you have a, an easy to read font, not using you know cursive? Um, I'm going to, I don't know who's training y'all over there, but a compliant document doesn't have to be visually boring. Um, and Aren't descriptions something that are, that are good for everyone? I, I think sometimes we. Sort of well, part of what happens with with uh, with graphics is uh, I teach science classes, so there's graphics all over the place, especially from textbooks. And sometimes uh, a description of a graphic, like let's say it's a life cycle of a parasite, there may be there may be a really really detailed graphic. So the graphic description may be like two to three paragraphs long. That's kind of the thing I'm referencing. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, there's a, I can point you to a resource. If you'll, if you'll email me, I'll give you a resource, a presentation we do on, on basically STEM image descriptions, how to do it in a way that makes it a little easier for you and a little better for your students. So we have a, we have a training on that. If you'll email me offline, I'll make sure you get that. and. Uh, you have Colleen Galan there. Uh, she's at the VLC there. Uh, she'll have some resources for you too. But if you can, if you email me that, I can, I think I can help you with that question, is what I'm saying. Sure. Yeah, uh, I'd be happy to do that. And another thing I have, and this is something I really struggle with. Um, so I enjoy going online and trying to find interactive simulations or activities that make certain scientific processes a little bit more fun, or at least they get to play with it on the computer. For example, mm -hmm. you'll find simulations where instead of just a three minute YouTube video on how DNA gets expressed, it will be a kind of a little game activity that someone already designed that had nothing to do with me. I was just able to find it, but that a student can then kind of work through it or kind of go through this gene gets expressed. Here's the portion of DNA that gets read. Here's the enzyme that interacts with it. And I, I get very drawn to use those activities, but the problem becomes uh, that it may not be ADA compliant. The impression that I've gotten is if you want to provide a link to another resource, you have to be able to press tab to move through every single part of it. Mm -hmm. And then you have to be able to like press enter to start it or something like it has to be a single key that allows you to navigate through the entire thing. And then a separate key to actually use that thing it has to be able to read the activity to the person. Uh, and they should, I think the idea is they shouldn't have to use their mouse. So if they just have a keyboard and they're pressing tap and then enter, they can technically do the entire activity. Are those the, the fundamental rules of how it works? Yeah, pretty much. I should be able to do tab and I should go through, it should take me through. And this is something you might wanna uh, do on your own, right? So maybe one day, try to navigate through Chrome or whatever web browser you use, just using the tab key, uh, enter when you wanna do something. If you wanna reverse, you hit shift and tab, and it should take you everywhere on that site uh, if it's done accessibly. And believe it or not, um, a lot of what you're gonna see in Firefox and Chrome is gonna be accessible. You can navigate through it uh, just using a keyboard, uh, just using tab, shift tab to reverse, and your enter key. You should be able to do just about anything somebody with a mouse can do. 
Is it legally viable to provide something that is not ADA compliant as long as you're clear that it's not ADA compliant? Like, let's say you find a resource that you yourself did not design. You think it's remarkable and you think it would really improve student learning, but there are aspects that are not ADA compliant. If you if you recognize those things, are clear about it and explain it to the students, but then present it as an option for students that can use it, is that okay? Or are the rules that if everyone cannot use it equally, that it cannot be provided? Oh, no, that's not, well, no, I'm not a lawyer, so you need, you've got a lawyer there on staff. I will say this, if it's a, if it's a good resource um, that happens to not be ADA compliant, I would say use it. I would say also, though, I'd have a caveat there. I would say at least create an alternative assignment that, some, that is ADA compliant. So it doesn't have to, an equivalent, uh, it doesn't have to be, so in other words, you may have a game that, like you said, does sell. I don't, I don't know anything about biology. But no, I know what you mean. Sells or, or, or whatever, and it's, that game could be accessible. Try the tab key. It doesn't automatically have to be an inaccessible game. If you can tab through it, shift tab to reverse and get to everything, it may be, and depending on if it's HTML5, it probably is. So I wouldn't assume that part. But if it's something that's very valuable to you, I would use it. I would have an alternative uh, assignment, an alternative activity. So the key is you provide the assignment, but then you, you identify which portions can't may be difficult to use. And for any students that are incapable of using it or struggle with using it based on its configuration, to, con uh, to contact their instructor and there will be a separate backup assignment intended to address those students that reached out to the instructor that can be deployed right away. So you wouldn't necessarily have the two and say pick one because then it, that's not super clear. You would have no. the assignment and you'd say, hey, if you find that you can't do use this or if the fact that it's not ADA compliant uh, prevents you from completing the activity. Here's a second, let's say, hidden assignment that's already in the Blackboard folder. It just may be inaccessible to students. You then open it up and deploy it for that student specifically. You are allowed to do that? Yeah, you could do it that way. Or, you know, in your example, you said it, it was a, it's a choice, right? It's not required. It's not required of the class. So it's not my grade. This is an enrichment activity. Again, just because I'm disabled doesn't mean I shouldn't have enrichment activities either. But if it's not required, yeah, that's that's generally how, how it's done. And, and let's think about accessibility as not an either or, okay? Let's think about it as it's a process, right? It's a, it's a road we're on, it's a process. We're actually getting much, much better. I'm glad you mentioned uh, games because there's a, a game we're sort of working on I'll let the cat out of the bag. It is on sales. Um, I don't know much about sales. I'm a coder by nature. So we're working on it and it's fairly accessible. Um, it's not perfect. There's a couple of things that we're working on. So what I'm saying is there are, there are you can't look at it as that black and white because it, it's not. Um, what's going to get you sued I don't mean you personally, you know. I'm not, not no, I know you. what you mean. What's going to get your college sued is if you have requirements and you know they're inaccessible and you're requiring them and you're not giving them, your disabled students, any alternatives. You're just saying, you got to do this. If you can't, too bad, that's on you. Then that's what's going to get you in trouble. And, and I'd like to recommend oh, Okay. That. Yeah, so... Yeah, if you have a great source, I'm not saying don't use that that resource. No, no, that's not what I'm saying. Does did that make sense or did that? No, that makes sense. So your point is, if you find a resource that is remarkable, right? But let's say it's not completely ADA compliant. The worst way to deploy it would be to make it a graded activity, build it in an infrastructure where it's graded and then knowingly know that it's not ADA compliant, but the answer is, oh, who cares, it's so great, but then you make it graded and you don't provide an alternative. That's how you can create a trap. Yeah, yeah, you're gonna get big. There's about four colleges that have been sued in the past, I guess, four or five years. This pandemic has made time 
strange, but, and they were all sued for basically that sort of scenario. If they would have had an alternative and, and some, and one of the causes I'm not gonna say who, certain things you just don't put in right, right? You don't say, I'm not gonna do something. Uh, but if they had have a, a, you know, some equivalent access, uh, a different activity, or even not required it. Um, and that's why we started coming up with this, this sort of cell game that we could keyboard navigate. I mean, it's not ready. I'm not ready to share it. Um, not ready. But it's something we're, we're working on and, and creating those types of activities in an accessible manner is not as difficult as people make it out to be. Um, it, it really isn't, but th that's sort of another subject. But yeah, these are good questions. I'm glad you're asking these because um, they're gonna come up. People view it as either or, it's gotta be this, this, and this. And again, I tell people when I go visit a college, I'm not the accessibility police. I am the accessibility priest. I'm here to save you. I'm here to help you, all right? But I, my job, if the North Carolina Community College System had a job that was the, the accessibility police, I wouldn't want it, right? That's not my job. So my job is to help with pedagogy, help with accessibility. And it's not either or. So that's great questions. Any other questions? I, I like this type of discussion. Anybody else have anything they want to talk about? Or Brian, do you have another question? I mean, Ben, I'm sorry. No, it's cool. I actually, um, okay, so here's a scenario for you. So okay. I had a, a student a while ago. Um, mm -hmm. she, uh, she was for an online biology class. And she, one of the things that she's. You have my you have my email. I will share this with um, uh, with Miss Ali. She'll be able to, to distribute however she wants to. Um, and you know, call or email anytime with any questions on accessibility, online learning, things that we can do to to help. Uh, any questions before I leave? I see something's in the chat. Let me look. Oh, well, thank you for coming. I appreciate y'all coming and hopefully I'll talk to you all soon. And thank you so much, Dolores, for inviting me. Sorry I was late. I had the wrong time then. No problem. Thank you for the opportunity. Yes. I'm like Ben. Thank you for the opportunity with the wealth of information that you shared with the time that you have been with us. Two or three minutes. Hey, you're good. <laughs> so thank you. So you're good. You shared I pride myself on punctuality. So, <laughs> and Ben, uh, Ben, reach out. I, I can help you with those image descriptions, and I think we can get alleviate at least some of your concerns here. If you, if you reach out. yeah, that's no problem. What's your email, sir? Uh, let me put it in the chat. Let's see. Uh, yeah, there you go. All right, give me one second, sir. Uh, just let me know if you receive it. I'm just going to send it to you uh, in, a, in a sec. Let's see. Click on the provided link. It's going to be a little bit of attitude. And yeah, so uh, thanks everybody for coming. I really appreciate that. Um, sorry I was late. Um, I guess I'll see you again. Do we have another one scheduled? Do I well, this is it for our spring series. We're okay. wrapping up all of our spring workshops. We have one or two more, and then we'll be done. But then we will be getting ready for our summer um, series and our fall series. So this has been awesome. We appreciate you tremendously, um, Darren, for joining us and sharing the wealth of information. I hope that all of our participants do, you know, think about their own practices and, and um, uh, start to implement what you share with them how uh, they can be their in reference their practices for everybody and not just students who need it or prefer it, but for all for themselves to make it easier when they're presenting information or creating documents. So this has just been awesome. And do look forward to you coming back, Darren, as long as you accept our invitations to come back. Yeah, so we'll I, to have you again. I love talking about this stuff. So I'll be happy for summer, fall, or whenever. 
Okay, perfect. Thank you. And I did put a link um, in the chat, everyone. If you will give us some feedback about what you heard today, this helps us with planning as we get ready for fall programming or spring 23 programming. We try to plan out at least a semester ahead of time. So this helps us with um, the value and information you're getting so that we'll know um, how to plan in the future. So this is awesome. And it's great feedback um, for all our presenters, for Darren as well. So thank you. So do please um, give us some feedback for today's session. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay. thanks everybody. I'll see you soon. Bye. Take Thanks, care, everyone. Oh, ben, I got your message. Awesome, sir. Thank you.